Will's going to join us here. First time this season on FFT, hopefully first of many. And Will's going to give us some of his fantasy observations, things that he's looking at in regards to certain players and certain situations that could matter for you. And Will, let's start with one that I know you're very excited about because we did one draft together and you drafted both Packers running backs, Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. And you think Aaron Jones could potentially be the number one running back in fantasy. Yeah, I do. And by the way, uh, I'd also like to be addressed as reigning FFT champion. Reigning FFT as I, champion. As I did go, as I, you go undefeated in that league? Uh, no, I believe he lost uh, once. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Of course, 15 and one. I, like, like, it's like so rare to have a perfect season, right? And it, of course, it was ruined by late in the year by the one, the only, the not even checking his lineup, uh, <laughs> short tan Pete Prisco. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, look, Aaron Jones. So I, I've been saying this for a few months. It's sort of pound on the table here that, you know, the because the blind assumption is that all right, Devontae Adams just traded. The Packers don't do a whole lot in terms of adding guys in the offseason at the receiver position. Yeah, you know, you got um, Christian Wilkins, but rookie, and we know how that works out with Aaron Rodgers a lot of times. Sammy, you know, Sammy Watkins. Eh. Um, Alan Lazard to me, not a true number one. I think the. Wide receiver one for the for the Green Bay Packers is going to end up being Aaron Jones, and certainly a PPR. You crank his value way up. I've been I've been drafting him in best ball a ton uh, this off season, and, and I've been getting him. You know, you, for a while there, you could even get him in the third round. Uh, now, certainly, like middle of the second round is, is probably as lazy goes. And I would guess if you're in a PPR league, you're going to see him, you know, go. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Is it maybe late first round, early second round, I, I, depending on, I guess, who's in your league and, and you know, how much they value tight ends and, and how they prefer to draft wide receivers, et cetera. But uh, I mean, I like him better than Alvin Kamara. I think he'll finish above Joe Mixon, uh, certainly when looking at that list. And, and I think he could threaten number one overall in PPR because Aaron Rodgers is going to target him a ton. And we heard Rodgers say that both uh, Jones and Dylan are going to probably be on the field together m much of the time. And I think they're just going to split Jones out all over the place and let him work as a receiver a lot. I've got Jones second on the Packers with 70 catches, and I'd like to just go ahead and project him for first over Lazard. Last night we did a mock draft, and I had to actually handcuff myself to not draft Aaron Jones because I'd done it too much this year. It was really painful yeah. to pass on him at 19. But like Will said into the first round, I've got him at the ninth overall pick. I take him in the second round all the time because that's where he seems to go. Absolutely love this one. Yeah, uh, we, we saw there's been eight games over the last, you know, two-plus seasons where Devontae Adams has missed, and in those eight games, or missed or left, and Aaron Jones has averaged five catches per game in those outings. So Aaron Rodgers loves throwing to him, so PPR, he could be a monster. Don't forget about A.J. Dillon, though, too, because he did a good job four games last year with at least four catches. He's going to have a big role in the passing game as well, one of the better values in that round five range, depending on, again, like Will said, who you're drafting with. All right, another backfield that's uh, not as exciting but certainly more confusing is the Washington football team. And we saw in the preseason game uh, over the weekend that Brian Robinson was their lead running back and Antonio Gibson was playing more as a passing downs guy but also in a special teams role. So, Will, uh, you, you, I think, are a little confused like we are. Just uh, give us your take on this uh, on the commander's backfield now with Robinson and Gibson. Actually, Antonio Gibson, I don't know if you guys saw the news just now, but he's been moved to Waterboy. He's, uh, he's <laughs> off the of special teams, and he is, he's, been, he's been bumped down to Gatorade, Gatorade guy. I, I just think the bottom line is that Ron Rivera doesn't really like Antonio Gibson. And, and, not, like on a, and not like he's like, you know, da, you know dated like Ron Rivera's daughter and, and dumped her or anything like that. He just, I just think he's sick and tired of you know, Gibson's issues on the field and maybe like learning the playbook. R Rivera came in there into Washington as – a guy who's supposed to establish the culture, who's supposed to, you know, um, for, you know, create just just change a dysfunctional organization. He has a military style background, like like all football coaches do. He's disciplined, and I just think Gibson's. I think it's sort of a lack of like playbook discipline or on-field discipline or whatever it is. Uh, it would just improve it to his game. And I think the fact that Brian Robinson Jr., even though he might not be as an explosive an athlete or as dynamic a player. Uh, just the fact that he comes in and, and can just, you know, just be more serviceable, uh, I, to me, that that is what's causing the, the Washington football team or the commandos, commanders, whatever they're called, to bump him up above Gibson. And I think ultimately we might see uh, Robinson just be the guy for Ron Rivera's team. Yeah, I, I'm going to keep drafting Anto Antonio Gibson higher just because I think the upside difference between him and Robinson is pretty significant. And all those things that Will said about Ron Rivera are true, but also that kind of coach 
putting your lead running back, returning the opening kickoff, and starting a rookie over him in a preseason game sounds like the type of thing you might do to try to motivate somebody. So I think there's at least a possibility that Gibson still gets 50, 55 percent of the rush attempts, and he's going to catch a lot more passes than Robinson. I can see a path where Robinson becomes a poor man's version of Damian Harris. I don't think he's going to do much better than that. Gibson still has top 20 upside. I said this on our podcast. I'll say it again here. I'd like to go back in the time machine and keep J.D. McKissick on the Bills, have James Cook get drafted to the Cardinals, and have Antonio Gibson as the passing downs guy and Brian Robinson as the rushing downs guy. I think if Gibson was the that's pass a, that's catcher. A, that's a really – that's a really poor use of a time machine, by the way, Jamie. Well, I wouldn't, so I, many, I, like, I, I wouldn't so do it. There's so many better things you could do. Than, than, like, I, I got nothing. You're right. Um, but, you know, hey, I'm trying to make sense of it for fantasy managers. In any event, I'd like to see McKissick not on the team and uh, in a situation where Antonio Gibson using passing downs, Brian Robinson on rushing downs, that would save Gibson's fantasy value. So keep an eye on McKissick with the groin injury. Maybe he does miss some time, and Gibson can save his fantasy value if he's working in that role. All right, we all like to take swings and misses. Or we all like to take swings, not misses, but we have some misses. And last year, Will was all in on Trey Sermon. Oh, and God. now, now though, you think either you're just sticking to the take or, or you're hoping, uh, but Trey Sermon could potentially be the best running back in San Francisco based on maybe Elijah Mitchell dealing with what, once again, is another injury. Yeah, I mean, so this is, this is not like, I think Trey Sermon's going to steal the job type of a situation. Uh, it's more like if you sort of read the tea leaves of what's going on with Kyle Shanahan's running back depth chart, I think there's, I think that Trey Sermon may have done whatever was necessary to get out of the, the doghouse uh, and maybe get some reps. Now look, Ty- uh, Tyrion Davis price uh, is also a guy that I'm drafting a lot of. Uh, I want, I want, I mean, I have a lot of Elijah Mitchell, you know, and I, doing this mostly in uh, best ball because, you know, dra- you know, most of my drafts are starting to, to pick up now, but I, I think, Sermon just there's a, there's just a path where, like it doesn't feel like he's in the doghouse quite like he was last week or last year excuse me with the with the whole whatever went down with Brandon Ayuk or they like maybe broke curfew or did something and and I, I just have a uh, I think I want to have a little piece of him on the back end in deeper leagues and just keep an eye on him you know if you're drafting a shallow league maybe you go zero RB he's a guy that you could pick up late in the draft it you know, costs virtually nothing and then. You know, if it's, a, if it's a league where you have short, shorter, you know, shorter benches, smaller rosters, just keep an eye on him and keep an eye on that situation. Because if you get some injuries to running backs in San Francisco and he just happens to be the guy, he can certainly step in there and perform. We had our friend Ben Gretsch come back on our YouTube stream last night, and he was the first guy I ever heard say, take lock. And I think that's take lock with <laughs> the Trey Sermon idea, the idea that Trey, I mean, he might be the number one running back for San Francisco, he might get cut next week, and that wouldn't really surprise me all that much either. I, I still think right now if Mitchell's not ready for week one, Jeff Wilson probably starts. And then there's some sort of split up between the other three running backs. This is a, a messy, messy situation, but I don't disagree that in deeper leagues, you probably draft all four. We have a 26-round IDP league that mm-hmm. we do, and I took both Jeff Wilson and Trey Sermon just with the chance of one of them hitting. Now, that's a very deep bench, so certainly goes to what Will is saying, but I do think that this is not a bad idea to take a chance on a guy like Sermon or Wilson or Tyrion Davis-Price because Kyle Shannon has been the coach of San Francisco for five years. He has had a different ru- leading rusher in all five years. Now, it's most likely going to be Trey Lance in year six, uh, but in any event, I think you take a shot on one of these running backs. If it's not Elijah Mitchell earlier, round six, round seven, one of these guys like Trey Sermon is certainly a good late-round flyer for sure. A guy who's not going to be a late-round flyer just continues to move up and up and up, especially after he caught another touchdown in the preseason against the Broncos is Bills receiver Gabriel Davis entering his third season. And, uh, Will, you think he's headed for a potential monster year this year? Yeah, I mean, it, like, look, not like that's an original take, right? I mean, after the what, the four-touchdown playoff game, you know, everybody everybody's in on Gabe Davis. Everybody thinks Gabe Davis could be a, a great player. I, I just have sort of come around on where I, w- was. I was. I was really passing on him. In, in drafts early, you know, earlier this offseason, mainly because the price just felt like it was too high. But there's, you know, now you can really do, especially again, I mean, I'm not to just reference best ball, but I've been doing a lot of the best ball drafts. You can do the stacks and you can do this in season long. You could stack Stephon Diggs and Josh Allen and Gabe Davis. And they, they happen to be, you know, the best offense in football, which wouldn't be shocking at all. All of a sudden, you, you know, you're loaded week in and week out. I think the thing with Davis that's so intriguing is that, you know, whereas, you know, 
the previous year you know, he wasn't playing on a full-time role necessarily and now it looks like with the usage that they've got him out there in the preseason that he is going to just be lined up with Stephon Diggs on the field uh, the entire you know the entire time and if that's the case then this offense unless Sean McDermott just comes in and drastically dials back the pass the pass volume and they and they start to run a little bit more which is not, not entirely possible with the new OC and Ken Dorsey uh, you know there's going to be plenty of targets to go around for both of those guys and I think it's a pretty easy stack to pull off in, in in season-long fantasy. Can I just request to not be on any more Gabriel Davis <laughs> segments? I don't like poo-pooing anything. I just like to be excited about the exciting guy. He is an exciting guy. The, the playoff game was awesome. I, what, what bothers me, and I think what Will hit on, like his best ball ADP makes a lot more sense to me than drafting him there in redraft. Because if you're trying to pair him up with Josh Allen, go ahead and reach for him a little bit. If you're looking for spike weeks, he's going to have spike weeks. Go get that guy. I don't think he's going to be someone who's a regular starter even in a three wide receiver league. I just think wow. like you look at what they, they did last year and I don't think it's as simple as just saying, okay, you combine Gabriel Davis's targets and Emmanuel Sanders targets and those all go to Gabe. You combine McKenzie's targets and Cole Beasley's and those all go to McKenzie because there are still other wide receivers who are going to be involved. The one thing that, you know, I, I was a little concerned with was what's James Cook going to do because they didn't really have a pass catching back. And maybe what is OJ Howard going to do because they didn't necessarily have a second tight end that they trust. And those guys have been, for the most part, invisible. And the reports are Cook not until midseason. You might not see the best of him, which could clearly impact Davis. And Howard, according to Pete Prisco, who was there, said he's basically behind Tommy Sweeney at this point with how he's operating. And so if we're just back to kind of it's Diggs, it's a second guy, and then McKenzie is the slot guy, it could be similar to yeah. what we saw. I'm, I'm with Will. I think there's a huge season coming for Gabe Davis. I said this here. We're going to talk about props a little bit later in the show, that he could be the touchdown leader in the NFL based on what we saw. And hopefully he does catch a little bit more passes because clearly there's a lot of upside with a receiver being paired with Josh Allen. Uh, George Pickens is a guy that people are getting excited about as well, Will. And this is somebody that you think has another guy that has a chance to be a potential monster for his uh, rookie campaign. Yeah, I mean, you know, he fell because of some off-field concerns that were out there, some maturity concerns, I think was Pete Prisco maybe phrased it. And, uh, you know, you get him in Pittsburgh. I, I think I'm starting to come around the idea that the Pittsburgh offense with, and I keep saying this out loud, but Mitch, some com Frankenstein combination of Mitchell Trubisky and, uh, and Kenny Pickett might be a little bit more explosive, a little more exciting than maybe we're giving it credit for, or at least has enough volume to sustain a couple of wide receivers there. Um, it, it, it'd be very interesting to see what happens um, so I believe, I think it was uh, 21 of 25 snaps in the last preseason game, they had three wide receivers out there. And then in the other four snaps, they rotated entirely different combinations of the two of the three wide receivers. So it was like tough to figure out exactly who's gonna be running with the ones if they go two wide receiver sets. I would guess that they have three wide receivers out there pretty regularly, you see where he ranks. Um, I don't know that I'm taking him over Tyler. I mean, obviously he's right behind Tyler Lockett. But I think when you start to look at these, you know, you look at these rookie wide receivers, everybody was, has been you know, banging the table about Traylon Burks because of the volume. But I mean, I think there's a, I would prefer Pickens at this point. And I have been more quarterback questions when it comes to like Jahan Dotson and Garrett Wilson. Uh, and Chris Olave too, to be perfectly frank. Yeah, that, I'm glad I'm back on Will's side with this. I think George Pickens is already better than Chase Claypool. And I, I honestly think that there's a chance that by this time next year, we're saying George Pickens is better than Deontay Johnson, too. He is an absolute star as long as everything injury-wise and off the field goes the right direction. This is going to sound a little weird, but I think Pickens and what he's shown is actually going to benefit Chase Claypool because now they can play him in the slot. He was much better as a slot receiver, big slot receiver, as a rookie in 2020. 14 of 16 snaps in the slot against the Jaguars in the preseason game. So having him there, and as Will said, going with these three wide receivers, I think will open up things for everybody because while it might hurt Deontay Johnson's ceiling, which I think we've all kind of um, come to understand, he's still going to be very good. And again, if the quarterback play, the Frankenstein combination, I like that. I think we all hope to see Kenny Pickett at this point, but the Frankenstein combination can still keep these guys afloat, maybe be a better offense because more mobility at the quarterback position and maybe more downfield throws as well. So yeah, I think George Pickens is in a very good spot, and I agree with you, Will. To me, he's the second best rookie wide receiver you can draft behind Drake London at this point. One offense you might want to avoid altogether could be the New England Patriots. So we started the show with our headlines talking about what Bill Belichick said about the running backs with Harris and Stevenson and even Ty Montgomery all playing on passing down situations. You have a receiving court that already lost one guy in Tyquan Thornton, Devontae Parker, Jacoby Myers, Kendrick Bourne, Nelson Aguilar. Think about those names. Hunter Henry at tight end and Mac Jones in his second year. So, Will, is this an offense that you're targeting or running away from? Okay, so, like, I, I'm not in the business of questioning Bill Belichick. 
uh, that's it's, it doesn't it doesn't go well for most people who do it most of the time. But like he has Matt Patricia and Joe Judge running his offense. How is this going to work? I mean, you Matt Patricia, like Belichick designed it. Matt Patricia's calling plays, and Joe Judge is the quarterbacks coach. I mean, it, it's it. It's, it's wild to me that this is what they're trying to roll with. I mean, it reminds me of when the Eagles and Andy Reid named Juan Castillo, uh, his offensive line coach, his new defensive coordinator after he fired Sean McDermott. And, and the dream team happened and, and it exploded and, and it was terrible. So, I mean, I, I just, I, I think that the one thing I'd be interested in is if I'm, if I'm going no, if I'm going zero RB or like, you know, stud RB and then wait to take a second guy, I'm not opposed to uh, going after Damian Harris or Ramon J. Stevenson. Both guys have been getting third down work. Uh, in the preseason, it seems like you know Ty Montgomery will be involved in passing downs, of course. But it does feel like because of this, the way that this offense sets up with Belichick being the guy who allegedly designed it and and, and wants to go with it, that you know there's going to be a ton of runs. Uh, they're, they're they're apparently switching from you know power run to a zone scheme, uh, which is causing cause some problems for Mac Jones. The offense hasn't looked good, but I think there will probably be sustainable volume for some of those guys, at least in terms of the run game. Yeah, I'm terrified. I do not have a Patriots player in my top seven rounds. Damian Harris is the only one in the first eight rounds, and he's the next to last pick in round eight. So I, I have not drafted very many Patriots at all this year. The one guy that I was excited about is just getting too much buzz, is that's Ramondre Stevenson, because I think, you know, when you started, the, we started this process, it was Harris, and then we'll see what the passing down guy is going to be, and Stevenson more of a, you know, handcuff, but he's getting more opportunities with the first team, getting more opportunities to play in passing downs. But if I, I got to say this, though. If Harris is playing on passing downs, that's a huge benefit for him because we didn't see that last yeah. year, and he should still be the lead guy. So it's all about cost, and if you get him after round seven, I think that's fine. 